All right, so now we've talked, we've, we've talked about um, elastic theory. We've talked about how soils are or aren't elastic. Uh, and we've shown the stress strain models for soils. Now we're going to look at elastic so solutions that we actually use every day in, uh, in soil mechanics and talk about whether they're appropriate or not appropriate. And th this is one of the few big hairy derivation uh, uh, presentations we're going to do. We're going to look at where, because we use these elastic solutions all the time, look at where they came from, what assumptions were made to get them, and how valid they are. And then at the very end, I hope I'll have some time to go into rock science and show, show you the, the other ways we can solve these things when uh, uh, using elastic theory, but in a way that allows us to account for, for uh, di uh, different, more realistic soil conditions. So um, this is a lot of, uh, this is a long set of learning objectives, but they basically say, be able to use the elastic solutions like those that are in Poulos and Davis or in Holtz, Kovacs, and Sheehan to calculate stress distribution. And that, that's, that's what that all says. And also understand where these, um, where these assum the assumptions for these come from. So, so we've all done this, right? We want to know, well, we're doing a settlement calculation or we want to know the stresses on a pipe underneath the square footing. So we pull out one of these charts like this and we say, oh, well, you know, I've got this I've got this pipe that's going to, you know, run along uh, right, right through the middle of this footing, and it's going to be, you know, uh, one and a half b. Or it's going to be one b below the footing. Well, that means it's going to run right along this line right there. What are the stresses going to be? Well, right here under the middle, um, the stresses are about halfway between 0.3 and 0.4. So it's going to, you know, delta sigma z is going to be uh, 0.35 times sigma 0 if sigma 0 is whatever I put on the surface there, right? And then out here at the edge, if I want to know what's going on at the edge, well, that's about right here. Uh, it's not quite halfway between these two, so let's say it's like 0.26. At that point, delta sigma z, uh, Delta sigma z is going to be equal to 0 0.26 times sigma 0, right? Okay, so we all know how to do that. That's no problem. Uh, there's another one of those. We're going to talk about that one later. And, and if, I, if this comes out of um, um, Professor Kuduro's in our textbook, but it's also in Poulos and Davis. This, these are the equations for a point load. You know, if you've got a, you know, an infinite... Uh, semi-infinite surface and you got a single point load on it here, P, you know, these are the equations for delta sigma x, delta sigma z, uh, do, sorry, delta sigma y and delta sigma z all as a function of where you are, you know, at some point underneath that, that, that point load. And, you know, this is, this is the, the Boussinet solution because this, notice the guy was a mathematician, right? <clears throat> So, and the question is, well, where, where do these things really come from? So we're going to get into all kind of gross, hairy detail about where they come from so we can, we can talk about that for once. And then you'll never have to worry about it again. Okay. Well, we're going to start um, because, remember, the three-dimensional stress tensor was pretty complicated. We're going to do this under plane strain conditions because it makes it a little smaller and easier to work with. So I'm going to do a solution for the stress distribution under plane strain conditions. In fact, I'm going to do the solution for a line load under strain plane conditions. So the solution I'm actually going to do is for, if we got our, um, our space that goes on forever, and I've got a line load applied along here. It goes on forever and ever. So this is like a K-rail in the middle of the highway or something. Uh, I'm going to do that solution because it's it's plane strain because whatever's going on in this plane is the same thing that's going on in this plane right here, right? And so it's plane strain conditions. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Okay, so if you remember under plane strain conditions, the epsilon y was equal to zero, and the and the and the, the two shear stresses in the Y planes, they've got both got to be equal to zero or else what's going on in the, that purple plane is not the same as what's going on in the red plane. Uh, so these, these shear stresses are all equal and you know, equal to zero. Uh, and then we're going to have a, uh, we're going to assume we have a linear elastic material because that was one of the assumptions on the Boussinet stress distribution. 
In that case, uh, we already did this solution, uh, so this is all in your notes already. Sigma y was equal to nu times the sum of the x and z stresses. Um, and this was our original um, matrix, but when I put in uh, when I put in zeros for this and this, right, and then I, and I and I put in the equation for y, I get a simplified uh, stress I get a simplified uh, stress strain tensor that looks like this, because now it's only a function of sigma x, sigma z, and tau zx. Right? So this is all review so far. Okay? We good? Happy? Having so much fun you can't stand it? It's getting better. All right. Um, but, you know, these, these strains on this side, you know, are not independent, but they're a function of the displacements we, we, that we have in, in the mass. So you remember, and we, de we derived these before, that that uh, epsilon x was the partial of the u dis displacement in the x direction u with respect to x, right? Um, epsilon uh, z is the displace w the re displacement in the u direction the z direction with respect to z, uh, you know. And then the shear stress, if you remember, was the cross uh, was du dz plus uh, dw dx. Okay, so if I put these, um, so this is where mathematicians come in, right? Because I, I don't know how mathematicians think of these things. You know, I, you know, when you were in high school, everybody told you you had to be good in math and, you know, to be in engineering. And I think mathematicians are a whole lot more like poets than, than engineers or like mathematicians or something, because I don't know how they think this stuff up. But this is how the solution goes. So if I take that um, uh, and differentiate it twice, twice with respect to z, I'm going to get that the second partial of epsilon dz is equal to third partial of u dx times dz. Now, it's not apparent at all why we would do this, but it will be in the end. And similarly, if I, if I differentiate uh, epsilon z uh, with respect to x twice, I'm going to get that the third partial of w with respect to x squared dz and if I differentiate this uh, with respect to x and z, I'm going to get that the second partial of the shear strain with respect to z is equal to the third partial of u dx dz squared plus the third partial of w dx squared dz. Okay, so why would I want to do that? Well, I'm going to put those all together. Um, um, and combine them and we get this, this is called the strain compatibility equation. Because you notice that um, you notice that this is this and this is that. So when I so I'm just going to substitute this guy in for uh, this and this guy in for that, and then I get this equation. Are you following me? And if you think about it, remember think about our baseball. You, know, you throw it down there, and it finally gets hit, and it gets you know it deforms. And it, and it had deformation that was both, both normal shear, and so it, it, you can't have a single deformation, or, or maybe even easier, think about our cylinder. Remember when we took a cylinder and put it in uniaxial compression? It only had one load, but it had both shear stress and normal stress. So the, the, the shear stresses and the normal stresses and the strains aren't independent of each other. They're related by the displacements. And, and whatever displacement you go is going to generate you know, more than one kind of stress. So that's, that's, I think, the easiest way to think about it. It's a little complicated. But the, the three strains are independent of each other. It depends on what happens to those displacements. So this is called the strain compatibility, because this, this is just saying, if, you know, if I have these strains, they're related in this way. It doesn't say anything about what the strain is. It just says they're related in this fashion. OK. So, um, so hold that in the back of your head. We'll come back to it. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to differentiate my, my uh, stress-strain uh, uh, um, equations with respect to, to x and z. And all I'm going to do to show you this, I'm just going to do the first row here, because uh, it's complicated enough. So we're just going to do the first row. So notice that um, 
this, this is zero, so my tau term in the first row goes out, and all I have is sigma x and sigma z. So this is just the, the first row there, right? And then I'm going to differentiate epsilon x, so I'm just doing the first row, epsilon x twice with respect to z. So I have to differentiate this, this uh, little thing here twice with respect to z. Do you understand what I'm doing here? I'm just, and I'm, we're going to do this for all three equations, but I'm only going to show you one of them, and I'm going to wave my hands, and magically the other two are going to appear. But do you understand where we're going with this? Yeah, okay. This is just math. It's an amazing thing to watch. It's like going to a symphony and going, well, that was really cool. I never could have done that, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I mean, this should be, um, so, I mean, this is pretty simple, right? This thing's constant, right? So that comes out of the differential. And then all you're differentiating is this thing twice. Well, that's simple. And this is just a constant there, and differentiating that thing twice, that's simple too, right? So this is, it's not like this is a hard differential to do. Even I could probably still do this one. So the, the answer then is the, the 1 plus nu squared over e comes out front, and then the, the first term is just the second partial of x with respect to z squared, right? And the second partial is that uh, nu over 1 minus nu comes out, and it's just the second partial of, z with res uh, of uh, sigma z with respect to z squared, okay? So this is not really that hard. You could, I, I probably could have made you do this. I know you wouldn't have wanted to. And then if I just, if I just um, follow through and do the same thing with the other ones, uh, I get these. Th th this one's a little more complicated because I'm going to differentiate against x versus z. But if you recall, this was just a constant times tau zx, so it's pretty simple. OK. Um, so and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine these. Notice, notice what I did this. You, you see these terms right here? Right? And you see these terms right here? So I'm going to take this guy, I'm going to plug him in there, I'm going to take this guy, I'm going to plug him in here, I'm going to take this guy, I'm going to plug him in here. And now what I'm, so I'm combining, I'm combining my elasticity solution with my strain compatibility. So you understand where we're going? Okay. So this is that equation. I generously didn't make you write this one down. Okay, and now I'm going to simplify this thing, and it's pretty obvious how it's, notice that I got all these guys in here. I can get rid of all those, right? So I get rid of all those terms, and then I have this. So it's just the second partial of sigma x with respect to z minus 1, uh, to nu over 1 minus nu times the second partial of z with respect to z squared minus 1 minus nu over minus nu over 1 minus nu times the second partial of x with respect to x squared plus the second partial of z with respect to x squared. And then on the, on the left-hand side, just 2 over 1 minus nu times the second partial of the shear stress with respect to x and z. And it's time for me to take a drink and watch you write. And then I'm just going to gather terms. I'm going to gather the I'm going to gather the one minus new terms together, um, and just have this this form of the equation. So all, all I did was this goes there, this goes there, and I gather these two things and put them there. So so we call this the stress compatibility uh, relationship. Um, because we've included, you know, we had the strain compatibility relationship, now we, we applied um, um, elasticity. We, we assume we have a linear elastic material, and now we've got the stress compatibility matrix, or equation, sorry, it's not a matrix. So what are the assumptions that we've applied so far? Actually, we've only applied one assumption. What do, you, what do we assume about our material so far? Well, okay, we, we're, we're doing this in plain strain just to make the problem simple. We could do this without plain strain. It would just be a hell of a lot more equations. So the plain strain is not, it's an assumption we did just to make it easier to write the equations, but it's not really restricting our material. We, this, this would apply. It, the, but the only, the only assumption we made is that it's elastic. We've, we've, applied, we, we've applied strain compatibility then the fact that it was elastic gives us this stress uh, compatibility equation. So the only assumption we made right now, this is a linear elastic material. 
And notice that the constants we have in here, and notice that the modulus goes away. All, the, only, the only constant in there is, is nu, because that's what relates the, stra the, stra the strains together, right? OK. Um, all right, so now what we're going to do is apply static equilibrium to the same equation. Or we're, we're going to apply static equilibrium, get a new set of equations, and we're going to put those together. Because we haven't done that yet, right? Okay, so here's my little elemental box, uh, you know, uh, and it's starting out, it's dz by dx. So if I start on this side, if my values on, at this point on the, uh, on the side of the, uh, of, the of the elemental area are sigma x and tau zx, on the other side over here, it's got to be sigma x plus the, plus the change in x as a function of x times the distance I went, which, which was dx, right? And the shear stress, oh, I'm sorry, and the, the, uh, the normal stress in the bottom, I start up here with sigma z, and I go, I go delta z for, away from it, so the normal stress on this side has got to be the sigma z I started with, plus the partial of, of uh, sigma z with respect to z, or the rate of change, times the distance I went dz. And similarly, the shear stresses, I started with tau z, uh, zx over here, so it's tau zx plus the partial of that with respect to x times dx. And on the bottom face, it's tau zx times the partial of uh, tau, uh, tau zx with respect to z times dz. And notice I'm using this little shorthand because we know sigma, tau zx is equal to tau xz, so I'm only using a, somebody brought this up the other day, but we're pretty sloppy. We usually get pretty sloppy in, these, in our tensor about the the, the, the um, shear stress and shear strain terms because it's symmetric and it's the same on one end of the other, so it doesn't matter what the subscripts are. All right, you understand what I'm doing right now? That's, and and, and now, now what we're going to do? We're going to sum forces in the x and the z direction, right? So we're going to sum forces in the x direction. Well, in the x direction, uh, let's see. So in the x direction, I've got sigma x sigma x plus the partial of uh, sigma x with respect to x times dx, and I've got um, uh, this component, right? So if I, you know, this is positive, that's negative. Um, you know, I've got the tau z there, so that's going to go away. So if I, if I, you know, if I get rid of um, the sigma x's and the tau x's, which are going to cancel, um, I'm going to have that equation for the summation of forces in the x direction, right? And similarly, in the z direction, um, uh, change color in the z direction, this sigma is going to cancel that, that tau is going to cancel this, whoops, cancel this one, and I'm going to end up with this equation for uh, summation of forces in the z direction. Simple enough? Okay. All right, so now I'm going to differentiate these things. And why am I going to differentiate these things? I'm going to differentiate because I watched a mathematician do this. That's why I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> because if you remember back in my uh, strain compatibility matrix, my stress compatibility matrix, I got all these second partials, right, of sigmas and z's and this stuff. So what I want to do is I want to get um, um, I want to get, whoops, one more. Um, I want to get this into that same form so I can put the two equations together. Okay, so we're going to pick up again. Um, so we just um, used our static equilibrium to get uh, these two equations for the forces in the x and y direction. and. Um, so now I'm going to add those together, and I'm going to differentiate, and we explain why we want to do that, because we want to get these second partials so we can plug them back into the, the stress compatibility equation. So, um, so if I go through there and just uh, uh, take the partial with respect to um, um, twice here, and there's partial with z twice here, well, I'm going to take x through and z through. Um, then I'm going to get this equation second partial of sigma x with respect to x squared plus the second partial of uh, uh, um, the shear stress with respect to x and z 
and and then sigma z with respect to z squared, and again the shear stress uh, with respect to x and z. Um, So now, now I'm going to do is pull the shear stress out, put it over here, take these two guys and put it over here. I'm going to have this, this equation. And I'm doing this because, remember, look, at, look at the forms of these. These are, these are the forms of the partials we have in uh, the stress equilibrium equation. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine that with the, with the stress equilibrium equation. This was our stress equilibrium equation, right? So I'm going to put, I'm going to substitute in here. Notice here's the second partial tau with respect to x and z, and here's the second partial with x with respect to z, and z with respect to x. So I'm going to make all those substitutions. Um, so this, this is the same equations, right? So when I do that, I end up with this really simple equation. That zero is equal to the second partial x with respect to z plus the second partial z with respect to x plus the second partial x with respect to x plus the second partial z with respect to z. Uh, and I can simplify that. This is just kind of a notational thing. Uh, but, but I can just say that this equation is, this is really just a notational thing. It's the second partial uh, with respect to x plus the second partial with respect to z of sigma x plus sigma z. Notice the tau's drop out when I do that. That's what's kind of fancy about it. That's really just a notational thing. Okay, so now what do I want to do? Well, so now my, so this is my, let me, let me go back a second. Um, so this is now my differential equation that I need to solve um, in order to calculate uh, stresses in, under plain strain conditions uh, in an infinite half space. That's the assumptions I've made for this whole thing. Um, so what I need now is um, I need a function in x and z, right, that re represent my state of stress. And in, in, in plain strain, all I need to know is sigma x and sigma z and tau xz, because sigma y is just a function of those. Um, and it needs, to, it needs to satisfy this equation, which is a stress compatibility equation, and it needs to satisfy the equilibrium equation. So that, I've got to find a function that satisfies those two equations. Oh, three equations, sorry. There's two equilibrium equations. So this is, again, um, mathematical magic, I guess, or brilliance maybe better than magic. So I'm going to define, I'm going to assume that there's some function out there, phi of x and y, such that, oh, that should be x and z, I'm sorry. Um, such that the second partial phi with respect to z is equal to sigma x, and the second partial phi with respect to uh, yeah, this is right. The second partial z with respect to x is sigma z, and tau is the second partial uh, of uh, phi with respect to x and z. These are this is called Airy stress function because Airy, I'm guessing, is the guy who finally figured this out. So if I if I substitute this stuff into the compatibility equation. Remember, my compatibility equation was, oops, it was back here. All right, the stress compatibility equation. If I substitute that in there and do those different differentiation, I'm going to get that the fourth partial of phi with respect to x to the fourth uh, plus two times the fourth partial of phi with respect to x squared z squared plus the fourth partial of phi with respect to z is equal to zero. And you ask, why should I care? Um, so, so what have we done so far? So, we've shown that we have a homogeneous isotropic linear elastic material that's under plane strain. That if I can find a function that satisfies this differential equation and meets my boundary conditions, then I can calculate. Uh, whoops, page up. That the, and meets my boundary conditions, then I can calculate the stresses any place in, in that um, 
I can calculate the stresses any place in that space with these equations, right? And what have I what have I what what have I applied? I applied uh, compatibility of the strain, and I used I assumed that it was linear elastic, so I got the stress compatibility equation, and then I applied equilibrium. That's all I've done. So really, the only assumption I've made in this so far is it is in it is in a, um, plain strain, which we pointed out, and I assume it's linear elastic. That's the only assumptions I've made. I should say I've made that. Buzanesk made. Okay, so that's what I'm after. I'm after that equation that satisfies that. Um, so let's look at a, uh, a simple loading condition. Of course, we have to satisfy the boundary condition, so let's apply the boundary condition. So our boundary conditions are going to be a line load uh, so that at, at you know, for um, z equals zero, for all x not equal zero, sigma z is equal to zero. In other words, you know, there's no stress any place out here. And that along this line, where uh, x is equal to zero, we, we have a we have a load or a, a load of uh, force per unit length. That's our boundary condition. Okay. So, you know when. We were out consuming large amounts of adult beverages one night, and suddenly dawned on us that if we picked that uh, x was a, that phi was equal to a times x times the inverse tangent of z over x, that would probably satisfy those equations, right? So that's what mathematicians are good for. This is why you should have a good mathematician to drink beer with. Um, and if we do that, and I can just differentiate that uh, uh, twice with respect to z, and I'm going to get sigma x, and twice with respect to x, I'm going to get sigma z and against uh, x and z, and I'll get tau z x, and then we know this, uh, this is just from our plane strain conditions. And so these are my solutions. Um, and I have this one, you know, what's, I only have this one uh, unknown in there, that's that, that constant a, so I only need one boundary condition to solve for that, which is good, because I only have one boundary condition, is that's that line load, right? So we need to we need to figure out what the, the what the what the constant is. So I'm going to apply my one boundary condition. So my boundary condition is really that if I integrate sigma x along sigma z for for z equals zero along uh, along x, that I've got to get you know from x from zero to infinity that I've got to get q because that was the boundary condition. So that's really my boundary condition. And if I do that, if you go back and look at the if you go back a slide. If I do that, the only way I can do that, I, when, I, when, I, when uh, I've got to have A here, sorry, right there, A has got to be equal to Q over pi is the only way I can make that happen. So that's pretty simple. So if I do that, these are then my three equations for the vertical stress, the stress in the x direction, and, and, uh, and tau xz uh, for any location in that infinite half space. And the only place it doesn't work is right directly under it because it goes to infinity, which makes sense because my line load has an infinite stress immediately underneath it, right? If you're absolutely underneath it, it's, it goes to infinity. But it works, it works fine every place else. And if you look in uh, Poulos and Davis, I don't think this solution is in Holson Kovacs and Sheehan, I don't think. But if you look in Poulos and Davis, you'll find that this is the solution for that. So that was a nice little detour in mathematics. And um, we do want to check the boundary conditions to make sure it all works. So when z is equal to 0, right, uh, that's good. Sigma x should, when z is equal to 0, sigma x should be 0, right? So we're going to check that. So if we plug z e equal to 0 in this one, well, z is in the top right there, so that's 0. That's good. And the shear stress on the surface has got to be equal to zero. And there's a z squared in there, so that's good. And the only place it doesn't, have, it doesn't meet the boundary conditions is where x is equal to zero. And as we told, there's a discontinuity there in our solution, because that's where we have this, we basically have this infinitely thin load applied there. So immediately under the load, it's like dancing with your girlfriend when she's in spiked heels and steps on your foot. You know, the stress is very high and painful. So, um, we, um, we don't have any solution at that point. 
So that's good because it checks out for the stuff that's simple for us. So that's how we come up with these solutions. Now what's the difference between that solution and these two solutions I show on this page? <laughs> you don't have to use the equation of these ones. Well this, one's, this one is, is simply for not for plain, neither one of these is for plain strain conditions. Right? And the only, thing, the only reason we did plain strain conditions is because the equations are easier. Right? So neither one of these is for plain strain conditions. And they're for different boundary conditions. This is the boundary condition where you've got a square, lo square area loaded on the surface, right? And this boundary condition is for an arbitrary rectangle, but we're only calculating the stresses under the corner of the rectangle. But these are all Boussinet stress distributions, and they, they make the same assumptions. So they, all, the only assumption they make is the material is linear elastic, and that the boundary conditions that are specific to the solution apply. And it's an infinite half space. And, and the, that's it. So these are good for any elastic solution, for any elastic material. So can we use these for soils? Well, <laughs> so for monotonic loading, in other words, for, for a single, when loading always increases, the soils are either, we, the soils are either elastic strain hardening or strain softening, so at least they're not elastoplastic. Now, they, they will if you unload. So this certainly doesn't apply if you, this certainly does not, will not give you the stresses if you load an area and unload it. But for monotonic loading, you know, it's at least an approximate solution. So, and we use these all the time, right? All right. So I can't remember if I got another slide here or not. Oh, so this, and this is just, this is, this is a solution that's in, um, uh, in your textbook, and this one's just for a circular, circularly loaded area. So this is an area of 2R, uh, and again, this just gives you the, uh, the the loads as a function of the contact stress, um, um, and there's your equations. So that's just so all these solutions are the same in the sense that they have the same assumptions. The only things that are different are the surface condition, the boundary surface conditions over which the stress is being applied. So they only they only theoretically correct for for linear elastic material. So they're certainly good for overconsolidated clays, right? Or for rocks, or, or for uh, any of those materials that like that that those uh, residual soils we looked at that were clearly quite linear, and they're not necessarily that bad on monotonic loading for uh, for other materials. All right, uh, we have one more thing to discuss. Uh, and then I'll show you how you how you deal with things that are more complicated. So the the, the limit, you know, w w what's the big limitation of these to these methods though, besides the fact that they're limited to, to uh, besides the fact that they're limited to only um, linear elastic materials. If we accept that, that we accept that limitation, the other limitation is what? Hmm. Well, yeah, they're, they're only got certain. There's only solutions for certain shapes. You got solutions for line loads. You got solutions for embankments. You, you, there, are, there are solutions out there. For example, let's see, where do I have a blank spot here? There are solutions for uh, you, in, in Poulos and Davis. You can get a solution for an embankment load that, that looks like that. You know, it's infinitely long in this direction. There's a solution for that. Um, there's solutions for line loads, point loads. But you know, we have lots of things that don't look like any of that stuff. And they're for uniform materials. They don't cover material that has a stiff layer. You know, if this is has E1 and this is E2, and then over here you have an E3, you know, and E1 is greater than E2 because you've got a desiccated crust, but E3 is the biggest of all because it's rock, so it's greater than E1 and greater than E and greater than E2, right? How do you do that one? Well, and if you look in and if you look in um, Poulos and Davis, there are a few solutions uh, uh, for some layered systems, but they're very limited. So there's lots of places where, there's, where we can't use these particularly well. Um, and so we're going to talk about numerical uh, solutions uh, in just a minute. Um, OK. There's one more thing that's really important. It's a behavior that's really important that we have to look at. Um, and I want to start by, before we talk about contact stresses in general, I want to look at this little problem right here, where what we have is um, a uniform load 
applied to a material where E is constant. I'll come back to, to about what that means. And let's go back for a second and, and look at this solution. So this, this is the easiest one, the easiest solution. So I've got a square area, right? And this, these assumptions assume that you have a uniform stress applied across the top. So lots of times we talk about these solutions, we call them for a flexible footing. In other words, you put some, if you have some load that's being distributed over an area, uh, you, you know, somehow that is, that, 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 that load is evenly distributed over the area. So like the, the classic flexible footing is, is, a, is a fuel tank or a water tank with a, you know, really, you know, even a, even a thick steel base on those is only three quarters of an inch thick. And so, you know, over 100 feet, that's pretty flexible. And you fill it full of water or you fill it full of fuel and you basically have a uniform stress distributed over the whole part. So that's, that's actually what these solutions are for. A footing doesn't look much like that, right? Um, but if you have some, some uh, uh, load applied like that, how much settlement are you going to get under the middle of this footing versus, versus under the edge of this footing if this was a perfectly flexible footing? Are they going to be equal? Well, you got, your stresses penetrate deeper under the, under the middle than they do under the edge, right? So if the stresses are higher under the middle than under the edge, when you integrate the stress times the modulus, you're going to get more displacement, right? Okay. So let's go back to this. So, um, so that's the case. Um, that's this case right here, where I have a flexible footing. Um, and it's over material that has a constant modulus. So I have a uniform stress applied. And I'm going to get a settlement profile that looks like this, where I've got more settlement in the middle than I have on the edges. OK? But that's only one possible cases that we have. So let's, now we're going to go through these, this. This figure comes direct out of your text. For sands, um, is my, so there's, there's, two, there's two things that are going to happen. One is I can have a footing that's not flexible. You know, for most footings for buildings, let's say your footing's, you know, it's, let's say it's a big building with a big load, you know, your footing's two meters wide, you know, and 0.7 meters thick. I don't care how big a load you put in the middle, that thing is pretty stiff, right? And so if it's, if it's, a, if it's a stiff footing, um, um, if it's a stiff footing like these, or what we call a rigid footing, then it's not the stress that's going to be uniform. And that's not the boundary condition. The boundary condition is that the, the is that the displacement's going to be uniform, right? Well, if the displacement's going to be uniform for this material, this material right here is for E equals constant. So if I'm going to have the same displacement at the edges in the middle, right? And I have a, something with a constant modulus. I can't have the same stress distribution. I can't have this uniform stress distribution I had before because I know if I have a uniform stress distribution, I'm not going to get a constant displacement, right? Because I'm not going to get the strain's going to be higher in the middle than the edges. So if I want the strain to be the same at the edges versus the middle, what has to change? The stress has to change. So what I, what I have to do is I have to take some of this. Ah, that's not what I wanted to do. I have to take some of this stress in the middle. I got to push it out to the edges to increase the stress out to the out to the edges, so that I get more displacement at the edges relative to the middle, so that I get the uniform displacement. And that's exactly what happens for rigid footings on clay. And you get a you get contact stresses like this. And we this has actually been measured. When you get contact stresses that are much higher at the edges than are middle, why? Because at the edges you get the same amount of strain as you get in the middle. So you get and way more than the average strain at the, S, at the edges, and you get this non-uniform stress distribution. Okay, so that's that's what happens with 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 a, with a clay, which it, it, with, you know, linear elastic material. So we have a constant modulus. Um, if we have a flexible footing, we're going to have uniform stresses and non-uniform displacements. If we have a rigid footing, we have to have uniform displacements. That's going to give us non-uniform stresses. Well, what's going on with the sands? For the sand, 
the issue is E is not constant. Because with the sands, let's see. I don't want to go back. Remember with the sands, how quickly the modulus changed with stress? Right? So as I have a higher stress, I have a higher modulus. So as the stress goes up, it gets stiffer. Well, going back to this picture, just assuming uh, linear elastic conditions apply, where is the stress highest in this picture? Ah, don't do that. Do this. So under, so here's, you know, here's my, here's, my, here's the area under my footing. Where are the stress? Like, how high are the stresses right here? They're very, very low, and so the modulus is low there. But under the middle, how high are the stresses? They're very high, so the modulus is higher. In fact. If you've ever walked on the beach, ever walked in the, on the beach when it, you know up by the volleyball courts where it's dry, you know what's the modulus of that sand immediately under your feet? It's very very low, right? Because <laughs> it has no confining stress and it has a very low modulus. So, so for the sands, the modulus is going to be a function of the the confining stress. So, under the middle of the footing. So under the center of the footing here, let's let, let's let's go with our flexible footing, right? Um, we're going to have a uniform stress, but the modulus under the middle is going to be high, and the modulus under the edges are going to be low. So what's our displacement going to look like? We're going to get more displacement under the edges in the middle because we have a high modulus under the middle and a low modulus under the edges because the the sand's modulus isn't constant. This is why sidewalks. And, and slab and, and, and pavement slabs always break near the edges, right? There's other reasons, but that's one of the main reasons. Is you, you got no support right under the edge, or very little. What about the case where the displacements are uniform? Okay, now I'm, so I'm going to get a uniform displacement, but my modulus under the middle is high and my modulus under the edge is low. So how am I going to get a uniform displacement when I got a high modulus in the middle and a low modulus at the edges? I have to have more stress under the middle than I do the edges to make up for the difference in modulus, right? And if we measure the stresses under a slab that um, is on a on a cohesionless sand, we'll find it has very very low contact stresses under the edges and high contact higher contact stresses under the middle. And that's what. Um, that was this says. For sands, the modulus is a function of the confining stress. Uh, uh, so if we have a rigid footing, we have low stresses at the edge. And uh, if we have flexible, we have high displacements at the edge. Whereas for the clay, our modulus is pretty close to constant. So for the rigid clay, we've got to have high stresses at the edge. And for the flexible one, we have to have low displacements at the edges. And there's a little more than just elastic theory that's going on there, but from just from elastic theory, you can you can at least conceptually just dis describe these behaviors. All right, I think that's it. So, um, so these elastic solutions uh, depend on the assumptions of linear elasticity. Uh, and, and strain compatibility and equilibrium and the specified boundary conditions. So they're really, they're, they're perfectly appropriate for anything that's linear elastic with the boundary conditions that that particular solution applies to. Because these two, these two things are just statics. Um, and they're definitely useful for compu computing induced loads. There are many solutions available, but they're only available for simple boundary conditions and they're generally, uh, and they're also only available usually for fairly simple layering, either either uniform soils or one or two layers, or a, a, a uniform material over a perfectly stiff layer. Those are solutions like that. But there's not a lot of solutions for any any more complicated situations. And they can they can definitely explain some of our uh, observed behavior, such as contact stresses. So for anything more compli complicated than that, then we're going to be using. Um, um, uh, numeric solutions for, and that's the next thing I'm going to show you. So let me do that next. I, I've got time for a quick demo. Well, qu any questions about this part? So you don't have to you don't have to do that derivation. If you look at if if you go back and look at the learning outcomes, it doesn't say derive the 
uh, boost nest stress distribution for a line load using Aries stress functions. Right? The whole point of the exercise was to was just for you to understand where these solutions come from. So the, the last three equations, you don't expect us to. I expect you to be. Let, let's just go back to this. So what do I expect you to do? Because this is this is this is important. Because I don't want you to panic about that. So I expect you, if if given published solutions, right? I expect you. Um, to be able to compute stresses and strains for these kind of loads. Based on the graphs. Based on the graphs or based on the, your, your, your uh, next problem set is going to be to code up some of the simple ones in a spreadsheet and, and make for yourself your very own spreadsheet for some, some very common distributions of stresses. So it's, you know, the, the idea is it's something that you might actually want to use in the future for those of you that don't already have one. And, and I, I want you to do that. So, so you, the equations are going to be in Poulos and Davis or, or out of, out of uh, Holtz and Kovacs. And you're going to code those into your spreadsheet so you can calculate, so, you, so that you could create those charts if you wanted to. Because actually, usually, we, we really want those numeric numbers someplace. So I want you to be able to apply these solutions. Not derive them, not memorize them, but if I give you those solutions, I want you to be able to use them. So a, a, a linear elastic material is the assumption. That's the other thing I want you to get this, understand what, go, what, what the assumptions are behind these. Okay. But the application is for any type of... Uh, yes, but we use this, right? I mean, how many people are using this right now for materials that aren't linear elastic, right? Anybody, anybody that's out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're, and we'll talk about, you know, what's good and bad about that. Um, so, when we say Z is equal to Z, I'm um, sure. Let's just go back to the boundary conditions for that one. So this one. Ah, darn it. So, um, so I'm using this as my origin right here. So this is zero, zero, zero. Right. So the boundary conditions here is um, when x is equal to zero then I have this line load, right? Because well, when x is 0, I'm sorry, and z is equal to 0, then I know, and, and I know that uh, I've got this line load q. So if I integrate in this direction, I, I can't describe that at a point because it's an infinite, right? I can't describe it at a point. But I can describe if I took, if I took any elemental area here dy, and I integrate it in this direction from minus infinity to infinity in x, I've got to come up with q in sort of force per unit meter, right? So that, that boundary condition is most easily applied by saying that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of sigma x for um, x and for all z is equal to, for z equal to 0 times uh, dx is equal to q. So that's how I applied that boundary condition. I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually taking an elemental width here that's dy, because I've got to do that or else, I, or else it blows up when I get to the middle. But if I do that any place, I should get q. So that's the boundary condition. And then, and then you know, all, all over here, it's got to be 0, right? I don't know if I'm answering your question or not. OK. OK. I mean, I, to, to solve the difference equation, I have to find the boundary conditions. And there's one, there's one uh, constant in that differential equation, remember A. And so I, I'm going to solve for A by applying this boundary condition that I have this line load. And I can't define the line load at a point because, because at a point it's infinite. But I can integrate across a, 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 a space, and I have to come up with Q, if that makes sense. That's the way I think about it anyway. Yeah, 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 don't, don't, okay. There, there are probably some, uh, don't hold me hard and fast to the derivations because I'm just trying to show you the things that go in there. So it's equal, it's, it's continuity of strain. We apply um, linear elasticity, we get a stress continuity equation. Then we apply 
um, uh, um, just summation of forces of x and y is equal to zero, um, and we come up with our differential equation. And then we apply a boundary condition and we solve for the boundary condition. There's lots of magic in there about guessing the right forms of the equations and all kinds of stuff. But, you know, that's all math. Talking about this figure? Yeah. But we always um, kind of stress on the uh, settlement or, or strain, not on the stresses. So that's why. Well, so somet sometimes we want to know the stresses and sometimes we want to know the settlement, right? Yeah, but the stresses, when we found whatever they are the correct stresses, so it doesn't matter if they are more or less. But well, th those elastic solutions technically only apply for these condi uh, for these, these conditions where you have uniform, well actually technically they only apply, let me take that back, they only apply for, technically they only apply in this, in this case where you have a constant modulus and you have a uniform applied stress, right? Because that's what they were derived for. Um, so they don't predict, I mean you can't use those directly to predict this behavior or this behavior right, or, or, or this behavior, but you can show that if the, if the uh, modulus isn't constant or if the stress isn't applied constantly, the, the shape of things you would get. But you can't get those, you can't get the numeric values of this or this from those solutions because those solutions are really only for this case. Now we use them. I mean, the reason, the reason we're going through this is because, you know, we blindly just use those all the time, right? And, and what we're really doing in that case is we're calculating what's going on right under the middle and assuming it's the same every place else. Well, it isn't, which is like if you get to a mat foundation, which we're not going to cover in this class, but if you get to a mat foundation, you're not going to have uniform cells across it, right? Because it's way, it's, 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 it's not even close to this assumption. Yeah, and you'll, you'll hear some um, rules of thumb that you should take this, this value, the, 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 the displacements aren't uniform, so what you do is you take, you calculate the one in the middle and you take 85% of it and that kind of, you know, you see all these rules of thumb out there. And, and I, I'm not so sure that they're really based on anything except that usually when we calculate settlements, we overestimate them and so you multiply by 0.85 and it seems to work. But you could, you could convince yourself that since you're getting this non-uniform settlement, well, the, the, when you're in this rigid case, that you know, you're going to, in order to get this rigid settlement, it's got to be less than this peak settlement you'd have in the middle. You know, and it's certainly not going to be the amount that you have the edges. But I think that's just, I mean, that's kind of conceptually applying this concept that the stresses aren't unif the, the, the stresses can't be uniform to get a uniform settlement, and I can't quite get the same amount that I calculate with a uniform settlement, so I'm just going to reduce it by some amount, and 8.85 seems to work. It's not like somebody theoretically calculated it was 0.85 or something like that. So one question. Okay. Why do you consider that tension layers and compared to like a thick layer and then calculate our strain? Like when you are doing it in actual practice, you can see that like a foot layer under like whatever that you want. So we're going to, um, if we go back to the, to, so I'm, I'm going to punt that one down the street for for a couple of weeks because what, when we're we're going to now um, go back and talk about clay mineralogy and some more basic stuff, and then we come back at the a little later in the course we're going to talk about calculating settlement. That's when I'm going to talk about how we actually apply these things, and 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 how to how how to best apply them. So I I'm going to do the rude thing and kick that one down the the road. Um, and it's actually, unfortunately, it's going to be a couple of weeks because the I used to go straight into the elastics, calculating settlements on elasticity after this. But when I got the new textbook, it got too confusing to do it that way. So I'm I'm not going straight through the textbook, if you notice, but I'm trying not to bounce back and forth too much. But I, I've done a little bit. So if I don't answer that question in three weeks, then you can ask it again. That's not a very nice answer, but it's my answer for right now. It's really difficult. That's five months. Yeah.
but we're going to talk, when we when we talk about calculating settlements, we're 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 going to deal with that.